which, alas, I remember from the first time round, it knocked me out then. It's currently knocking out my daughter. So is the singer, Jason Donovan. <laughs> from an exhausting tour. Yeah, it's uh, it's sort of taken me by surprise. I can't believe it. It's sort of been so, uh, in, well, not intense, but it's been, we've been going along to sort of different areas, getting out there and meeting the kids, and I, I mean, I can't begin to tell you the reaction. It's just been fantastic, you know. And it's not like that in Australia. Well, I mean, it, it is and it isn't in some ways. I mean, you don't get the fanaticism as you do in, in, in uh, Britain, obviously, because it's got a lot to do with Neighbours as well, which is certainly peaking, I guess, here. Um, and Neighbours has been on television for, in Australia for like four years or yes. five years. But it's also because we gave birth to the Beatles, you know. I mean, we know how to treat our pop stars. Yeah, well, I think you do, actually. I think you, I think you do. <laughs> you certainly made me feel special. I What's mean, all this about breathing in jars? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. It's uh, I think you could blame Rip Sky from the Sun. I think it's <laughs> that's his idea, not mine. I um, I don't know too much about that. I certainly didn't breathe in too many of the jars, so I don't know what the whole story behind it. It was funny actually. We were at a certain place. I think it was in uh, Liverpool, and. Uh, there was this fan who was just going crazy and I sort of sat her down and said, you know, come on, calm down, calm down. And she brought along a jar with her and I, th and, and I thought, oh, that's a bit funny. And then she put my name on the front of the jar already. So she said, well, can you do me one favour, can you do me one favour and just breathe in the jar? And I said, okay, I'll breathe in the jar, just calm down, you know. So, so I did that and she was okay. But can you remember yourself in your youth? I mean, did you sort of lust after some pop idol or did you stand and wait in dark corridors for them? Um, 
I, I remember days when, um, this is, I feel quite old on this show, there's at least, you know, four or five year olds and you're 17, 16, <laughs> you're 16, 21 and I'm 21, Thursday. yeah. So, um, no, I, I was a fan of uh, Kiss, actually. I remember used to sitting up there and, and dressing up in uh, those big high-heeled boots and standing at the front of the stage, <laughs> pretending I was Ace Freely, you know, on the guitar, you know, doing that, that thing that, that Gene Simmons used to do. But, I mean, that's, that's, I think, the thing that most people sort of miss, you know, is the fact that this, the television and singing and music is so mysterious because you only see what's up there, you know. And behind it, there's a personality and a person that's quite normal like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But because of that image that's created, and I'm a fan too, you know. I, I, I mean, I, I was sitting at the, uh, the Dominion, we did a show the other night, and uh, there was Robert Palmer who was sort of sitting on this, and he started to strum his guitar, and I'm like, going, wow, you know, this is insane. I wish I could just hand over a piece of paper and get his autograph, you know. But it Peter, it hasn't gone to your head, the fame and the stardom. I, I gather your father has been worried that it might and thinks that you ought to think about giving it all up soon. Well, Dad's, I mean, Dad's been very um, influential, I guess, in my career because he's been around a lot, lot longer, I suppose, than I have in that sense. But he, he was always worried of me at the beginning, not so much now, that it's so insecure and that people's tastes change. And it's like anything, everything sort of changes and moves along. And like that, so to, to artists and, and so does acting or whatever. And he didn't want me to be in a position where I sort of building my hopes up to something, then all of a sudden I'd be let down. But I, I think I've been around him enough to realise that, you know, you can be up there one minute and down the next. And, and I mean, in Australia, for example, actors have sort of got like 99% unemployment as mm. opposed to 1% employment. So I'm very lucky. But if you do fall from the pinnacle where you undoubtedly are at the moment, you can always go back through the door of Ramsay yeah. Street. They left it open. Hey, for they've left it open for me. I can walk right back in there and see Charlene and, well, not see Charlene. <laughs> And all the other characters, yeah, no, it's, it's been left open. It was sad to leave the show, but it was time to move on. The likelihood of that happening is, I suspect, remote. Well, at this stage, yeah. I mean, the singing obviously has become, uh, become very important to me at the moment, and I'm sort of planning to move, uh, promote the album more in that sense. And you're going to the States to yeah. see if in August to see yeah. if the magic works there. Fingers crossed, who knows? Yeah. You were quoted as saying somewhere that you wanted to live here in London, that you quite liked it around here, is that right? Yeah, I do. I mean, my, my parents and my, um, my family are from Britain. I mean, I've, I've been very lucky. I've got a UK passport, so I can sort of... It's quite handy when it comes to customs time. You can sort of just walk through and walk in and out. He's one of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether that pleases anybody or not. <laughs> I'm all embarrassed Just now. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's. Um, I haven't made any definite plans to settle here, no, but I think, if, to, to quote the old cliche, I still call Australia home. So. Well, it's two or three years now since you learnt what success was about, since you said it's been growing and growing. I w can you analyse for a second what, what that's given to you, or what you've perhaps lost? What's it cost you, your success? Um, I don't think it's cost me anything. I mean, it, there are two scales to that. I mean, obviously, I've, I, you know, to go out in the street sometimes becomes a hassle. But I think that's in the mind more than anything. I mean, I think you can live a normal life whether you're Michael Jackson or uh, George Michael or Rick Astley. Well, you can. Well, not, because it means that, that people automatically assume they have the right, for example, as you know, to ask you about your private life. Sure. You lose your freedom. Oh, sure but you can still be a normal person inside, you know, and that's what I consider myself. I'm sure people come up to me on the street and do whatever, but that's not going to stop me from going down the street. If I want to do those things, I will do it. But what they all want to know is um, how interested are you in a certain lady called Miss Minou? Well, I mean, that question. The, well, I know the infamous connection. <laughs> well, success means that I have the license to ask To you, ask me that, yeah. Well, I mean, as I sort of said before, you know, it's it's been... It's the press, in some ways, have, have made that out to be more than it actually is. Well, it's a lovely romantic story. Well, it is, and it's what people would like, to, like it to be. And I think as a result of Neighbours, uh, the characters on Neighbours have worked extremely well. And maybe it's a credit to our acting. I don't know. People believe it's gone into the real life. This is a well-rehearsed answer. I'm just going <laughs> to... Victoria is, is our resident analyst on the sofa. I'm just going to ask you to try and sum up for us, Victoria. What is the, the appeal of this man? Speak for the masses now. 
Well, if you can't see it, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> what do I say to that? <laughs> well, I, I should know. say that she's no. young and fresh and outdoor and cold. <laughs> Don't go away. Don't go away. But you can applaud him for now, ladies and gentlemen, Jason. Day. If you're lucky, if you're lucky, he may yet speak again. <laughs> We're talking here about youthful success. You, Jason, the pop star, and you, Victoria, the writer. Now, we're going to look at an example of early success in quite a different field altogether. At least one... We all remember that the, the Prime Minister at that stage compared you to Pitt the Younger, but you're behind schedule because he was Prime Minister by the age of 24. That's right. Well, I don't think the Prime Minister would be very happy if I'd lived up to the uh, schedule. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> has that clip dogged you ever since? I mean, what it's it has a bit. years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, it dogged every time you put it on like that, you know, 12 years ago, but people don't forget. I think when I'm 60, people will still be saying, that's what you did when you were 16. Have you ever lived down when you were 16? Absolutely. Yeah. Certainly if you become Prime Minister. Certainly if you get into the Cabinet. Absolutely. They say, well, at that's 16, long way away. he was showing but, great problems. But I knew I'd lived it down about two years uh, after that, when I was walking down the street one day in Rotherham, where I come from originally, and a lady... Is Thatcher on your bedroom wall? <laughs> Do you still have a poster, Mrs Thatcher? No, I don't know, but now I can look at the real thing. So I don't even... <laughs> and you uh, played records, but they were Churchill's speeches. Well, I think I probably played a few other records at the time. You see, the thing, the thing that uh, nobody ever reports on, or the things that never gets into the media, is that you do normal things. Uh, and everybody, I'm sure everybody who's well known at an early age, does plenty of normal things and the average things of life as well. But those are not the sort of things that people want to know about. People like to see you as abnormal. What they perhaps saw you, because you, you also read Hansard in bed at night, I gather. All these awful facts we know about this. <laughs> A thing. sure way of getting to sleep. <laughs> yes. What, what they also, presumably, your friends would have said about you was that you were a SWAT, would they? No, I don't. Dr. Jason. Can't say I have. No, I don't think I have. No. <laughs> <laughs> but in a sense, I mean, if punk rock was sweeping the nation when you were making your, your political mark at 16, you were the rebel. That's right. I yeah. think that was odd for a chap. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I, I uh, obviously, because of my father, too, I mean, it was recognised. They used to, at school, they used to give me a hard time. I was in a television series called I Can Jump Puddles. And it's got, <laughs> when I was 13, I always had the syndrome of, Geez, I can jump puddles too. Yeah. All those kids at school sort of, you know, pretending they can do it. So. What did you do on a program called I Can Jump Puddles? I played a character called Freddy. It was like a 19, 1850s character. But he was okay. He was, he was quite cool. But. So, so a lot Not too much. No, no. Whereas this gentleman went along. I mean, lots of A's at A-level. He makes you sick. Always expect the fall one day. I suppose most things have gone quite well, but that's when you have to look out for the fall. You know, the pride comes... Exactly so, what Jason yeah, was saying, yeah, in a sense. Always got to be you... aware. Yes. And I think when I look at the other people you've had on the programme, I'm just about ready for retirement. Anyway. <laughs> 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 makes you feel a bit old. What, what worries you, then, if you can now look at from the grand old age of 28? What worries you about the children in Britain today? Have you got a major... ...that we may not seize all the opportunities that are there now for us. All the evidence is that this... ...are actually much more... ...more... ...we have to make sure that comes... And that, uh, ...we shot people with what we can do. What, you, you, you want them to... to I want them to do that, absolutely. But does but it... It's, but it, of course... It, we get the balance right in our generation. That's the problem, that the passion ceases to be for, for the beliefs and the convictions, which, to be fair to you, in, in the clip that dogs exactly what you have, was passion and conviction. And now perhaps young people are more and more passionate about money. Yes, which can be a healthy thing. It's, uh, you know, we should never be told that it's, uh, it's better for everybody if we're all poor and don't worry about money. But we do have to make sure that uh, we recognise that we need to share it out a bit. Right. Well, we shall put this theory to the test. But uh, for the moment, William Hayes.
some of our theories and ideas to the test and invite on a man who's made a close study of today's teenager, in fact, a close study of them. He admits the things that he tells them not to do. Here to is Sir Neville Butler. <laughs> First, Sue, I would say, follow that knot. We've had Dunphy, we've had uh, Victoria, we've had marvellous Jason, and we've had... <laughs> now, now we have a, a, a Nolan, no, not Nolan Janarian, a sextagenarian in his third childhood. <laughs> and I'll tell you, uh, I've been going around for years uh, telling young people that they shouldn't smoke, they shouldn't drink too much, um, they should take plenty of exercise, they shouldn't have too much stress, um, and, um, for, and they should too much saturated and fat, too much fat. Have. <laughs> yes, and, uh, sadly myself actually, love cream, cream, cream. <laughs> so you I, do all I, I drink, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I don't smoke, but I don't take much exercise unless I'm running for a train. I'm known as the late Professor Butler quite often. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have lots of stress on lovely programs like yours. Right. The stress factor is going up fast. Answer the first theory that William was, or, or, well, I was helping him put, I think, to an extent, that, that not that he needed my help, but I happen to agree. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> that, that teenagers today care too much about money and things material. Well, I think if we took out our, our, my four marvellous companions here, I think I'd bring a breath of difference here. Um, they, d uh, they don't care, um, not enough, as it were. I think what teenagers uh, want in life is uh, a, an interesting, happy, uh, productive sort of job in life. Um, they're worrying much less now about money and about the more practical things. Oh, about a third of them say they do they want a job that's well paid, and so do the others. But I think it's a different atmosphere now. So they don't worry quite so much about it. Well, there you are, you see. We're out of touch. Uh, well, I'm not sure that's right. I mean, if you go around the universities now, they're actually much more serious places and more concerned about the career that they're going to get into than they were 10 years ago, when we all went to university and thought, well, it'll take care of itself. Oh, in those days, you could all afford to go to university. Correct. <laughs> <Well, laughs> many people can afford it for that. But a, a good career, and if you can steer yourself into a good career, um, and something that you enjoy, happiness is going to come from that. And money's going to come from that in some yes. ways. So the job is very important in that sense. Yes, you need both. You yeah. need job satisfaction and the money. What about, Professor, teenagers, what are they most frightened of today? Well, we asked up my 15,000 uh, teenage companions who are just 12, 19 years of age last month. We asked them what were the things they were worried about, and three things stood out. One was famine. Well, this was three years ago when they were 16, and Band Aid and Ethiopia was uh, high in their minds, I think. The second was the employment problem that we've been hearing about. And the, the, the third thing um, was violence, terrorism, um, and violent behavior and mugging. And mugging. Is there a pro such a problem, Jason, in, in Australia? I mean, is it um, a... Well, I mean, it is to a certain extent. Uh, we obviously don't, I mean, I think I remember the last problem we had was like a, a massacre which was unfortunate in the center of Melbourne which has never been seen before a and massacre. that was well not a massacre a, a guy went down and shot people yes and I mean that concerns people but when you come to a country such as this size you don't realize it's the population that creates that that problem I think in some ways what do you mean by well that? obviously it's 16 Australia has got a country of a population of 16 million here, I, I estimate 60, maybe more. Uh, and with those amount of people, obviously your crime is going to be in a greater majority in, say, London than it is But do you sense Australia. here that we are a more violent society than yours? Or well, I think there's a lot more cultures and a lot more influence from the European countries. Australia is an island, and we don't have those influences so much. So therefore, therefore you get the conflicts between certain racial groups, I suppose, that causes mm. the violence. But William, uh, what the professor's 15,000 teenagers wanted done about this were a lot of hard and fast rules. They wanted to ban alcohol completely from anywhere near a football match. They want segregated 
uh, terraces and they want seats and they want to bring back hanging. This is right, isn't it, Professor? Yes, two-thirds of them wanted hanging brought back for murder and 70% wanted flogging for violent crime. Now, I take upon this to be insecurity. Do you? Yes, well, from their earlier lives. See, the interesting thing is, in those beliefs and attitudes, they're probably exactly representative of the rest of the population. And here we are saying that this is the, the strange characteristics of, of youth, that they advocate uh, these harsh uh, retributions or penalties. Uh, but I think you would find if you took a sample of people between 60 and 80 or 20 and 40, that but a you, similar answer would come out. But you can't possibly agree with that. You were the man who was asking for more freedom, rolling back the front. You can't want more rules, more punishments, more legislation. Well, it's perfectly consistent to believe uh, in rolling back the state, but in the state taking a hard line on some things. Uh, and I personally am in favour of capital punishment, as I would think of most of my constituents. Victoria, are you? Absolutely not. Absolutely no way. Never have been, never will be. Jason, do you believe Captain, in hanging? Um, well, I mean, if someone else kills someone else, yes. I mean, how do you know they have? I mean, well, and if that's the proof. I mean, if you prove something, then, then you can't get any better evidence. I mean, why, why should someone kill someone else for a, a, a reckless reason? Well, they shouldn't, but if you hang one person in a hundred years that wasn't guilty, then you just can't do it. Well, that's where the law courts and the systems have to be sorted out and make sure that they're, they're fair, I suppose. That's right. That is, the, that is the one most powerful argument against it, and you have to weigh that against the various arguments in favour. Professor, how much notice do these teenagers take of the politicians like William? Well, at 16, um, about 60% of them said that they didn't think it mattered, really, um, whether adults um, that were political or not, when they became adults. And about uh, nearly half of them said they didn't think it would matter whether they voted or not. Right. Now, whether when we see them again next year, when they're coming up to, J to Jason's age, um, coming up to, um, wh whether their views will have changed, I don't know. But there was an awful lot of disillusionment, I think, among them. So if the politicians don't influence them, who does? I think they want their parents to influence them more than, more than they do. Uh, do they? Yes, because sex education, they're only getting, getting talk to their parents about it in about 30% of cases. Double that number wanted. So they, and they want parents. a stronger line altogether from the parent? Yes, know? they're ambivalent about their parents. On the one hand, they say they're nagging, difficult, and, uh, you know, find life, uh, make life difficult. On the other, they say they love them and they'll always rely on them. That's exactly what you were saying, Victoria, mm. isn't it? Well, I get enough education, that is. <laughs> Let me ask you all a question to end with. Um, William, you first. If you had your teens all over again, and we know what you did with part of them, what wouldn't you do? I would still make the speech, just. Uh, I think I wouldn't go straight from school to university when I was 18. I'd take the opportunity to have a year and go around the world and be completely cut off from what's happening in England and do something different. Just let yourself breathe. Professor, what about you? I would ask my parents when I was 12 and everyone else whether they would please treat me as an, an, as an adult you know, rather than as an overgrown school child. Well said, well said. I'm sure there's been a lot of agreement out there. Jason, what about you? What wouldn't you have done? Um, I, I guess the one thing I regret not doing, I suppose, is listening to my father. Um, I did, but I didn't musically. Um, he was very keen on me to learn instruments and learn uh, piano and stuff like that and consistently persist with something till you get results and I regret not doing that. There's not many things though, I mean I, I've been very lucky and I really have, you know. I'm, we I can guess, see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Victoria. That. Hang on Victoria, quick word from you. Um, what wouldn't you have done? I wouldn't have gone to private school and there's a dress I wouldn't have worn to a party in 1982. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. You're very kind. Victoria Corum, Jason Dunn. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I'll be back on Friday with Thora Heard, Julie Walters, Cliff Richard and the Archers. Not all of them. Till then, good night.